For the next few Sundays, um, I'm going to look at Matthew's Gospel. And my aim, my dear friends, is to show you how Matthew's Gospel and the life of Jesus Christ fits into the unfolding of God's great plan of salvation. There's one great plan of salvation and Matthew shows how that all fits together and how it connects to the, to the Old Testament. My other aim is to actually show you how to understand the Gospels because sometimes you think the Gospels are very easy to understand, they're not. They're very difficult. So you need to uh, be given a method by which you can actually, how you can interpret the Gospel. And then I want to look at some of the implications of what we're going to be looking at today. M most Christians, by and large, I find most Christians uh, see the Gospels as merely a, a collection of the incidents in the life and ministry of Jesus and then of course his death on the cross. But very rarely do Christians actually understand how all of that fits into God's great plan of salvation. And I hope you know by now that the Bible is about God's great plan of salvation from Genesis to Revelation. It's all one plan. There's one plot, not two plots. There's one plot. And we often don't actually see that. Uh, his great plan of redemption. Old Testament and New Testament together. We use the term in our church, we've used it for a number of years, the big picture, the storyline of the Bible. Uh, and, and what we too often do is we isolate the events in the Old Testament and the history of Israel from the New Testament. And when we do that, at best, uh, particularly when we come to the Gospels and even the letters, we can at best have a superficial view of it or put it actually fall into error. And we've got to understand, folk, that the New Testament was written by Jews. Got to understand that. The, old, the New Testament was written by Jews. And, and they saw the life of Jesus as it relates and connected to the Old Testament. And what they want to show is that the New Testament isn't something new. The New Testament connects to the Old Testament. For example, in Romans chapter 1, uh, Paul, and I'm just going to read it to you, where Paul actually emphasizes, there are many other passages, but I'm just going to mention that one. Paul opens the letter to the Romans like this. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand to the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was a descendant from David, according to the flesh. So Paul makes that connection there. And, and one of the dangers we have, folk, is that so often we use our theological system, we all have theological systems, but very often we impose it upon the Bible. And, um, and it almost becomes like a pair of glasses, and we therefore don't really understand the absolute centrality of Jesus Christ in God's plan of salvation. You see, the New Testament writers knew that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that plan. Everything that you find in the Old Testament. The symbols, they were symbols. The rituals, the ceremonies, the laws, the land, the temple, the priesthood, the called men, the prophecies, all pointed only one way. They pointed to Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul is very categorical when he states this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. He says, All for all the promises of God find their yes, that's in other words, their fulfillment, in Him. And that is why it is through Him that we utter our Amen um, to God's glory. I need to move away here. My car is a problem here. Oh, that's better. Is it better? Let's see. No, it's shining much on me. All 
right. <clears throat> I, I've coined a phrase that I think summarizes the approach that I use. You've got to read the New Testament with Jewish eyes. Can I repeat that? You've got to read the New Testament with Jewish eyes, with New Testament spectacles. Does that make sense to you? It will make sense as we move on. Well, read the New, Te the New Testament as a Jew would, but with the New Testament glasses. It's very important. Unless you do that, you're going to have a superficial view of all of that. And I'm aware, my dear friend, that all of us, me included, we have our own theological systems, our own systems of doctrine, which those act as spectacles, so which you interpret the text. So I want to say to you, it takes real discipline and training and humility to allow the text to speak for itself. Don't impose on the text your own theological system. I make the same mistake. We all make it. And we've got to, through humility and discipline, not allow that to happen. And that's what I've been learning as I've got older and older. So, let me get to the text that we're going to be looking at uh, this Sunday and next Sunday and the following Sunday. Uh, and in, this, uh, in these messages... I want to focus on the first four chapters of Matthew. And I hope that it will stimulate you, stimulate your appetite to delve further uh, into Matthew's Gospel, for example, any other Gospel, using the approach. And I've got three messages I'm going to preach. My first message is today is chapter 1. And it's entitled, Jesus, the one who fulfills the covenant covenants God made with Abram and David. Jesus is the one who fulfills the covenants made with David, Abram and David. And that's chapter 1. In chapter 2, Jesus is the one who leads the true exodus. Jesus is the one who leads the true exodus. And that is chapter 2. In chapter 3, verse 13 to chapter 4, Jesus is the obedient Israel. Jesus is the true obedient Israel. All right, so those are my messages I'm going to be preaching. So let's begin with Matthew. Let me remind you, and you know that, Matthew was a Jew. And he wrote his gospel probably between 25 and 30 years after Jesus had ascended into heaven. And you also remember that the first people to become Christians were Jews, to a man. And they were Jews, remember the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> and it's only later on that increasingly Gentiles became Christians. Now also remember that those people who became Christians, the Jews, knew the Old Testament. They understood it. They were brought up in the Old Testament. And, and as you read Matthew's Gospel, you'll see that there's a very strong Jewish flavor there, if you read it very carefully. He has many, many quotes. He's quoting constantly from the Old Testament, constantly saying, well, this is what's happening to Jesus, but that fulfills an Old Testament prophecy. He does it all the time. He refers to Jewish customs, like hand-watching. He doesn't explain it. He doesn't have to explain it, because it's Jews who are reading it. And then there are many untranslated Aramaic terms that he uses. And again, it's, he understands the Jews understand that. And the question really is, why did Matthew write his gospel? There was a particular purpose why he wrote his gospel. He wrote his gospel, my dear friends, for Jewish readers. To show them that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the King of the Jews. That he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That he, in fact, is the king of the kingdom. And that's why you're going to find the term kingdom appears time and time again in his gospel. And as he applies the many Old Testament references. Now, put yourself in the position of a Jew, a Jewish Christian. They accepted Jesus as the Messiah. But how did that all fit in with the Old Testament? How did it fit in with the Jewish roots? For example, what about the place of the law? What 
about the many customs and ceremonies? What about the traditions they'd grown up with? What about Israel? And God's dealing with her over 2,000 years up to the coming of Christ. And you should understand that it was extremely relevant to them at that time because increasingly what they were seeing by the time he was writing, when Matthew wrote, increasingly what they'd been actually seeing is that increasingly Jews were rejecting the gospel. And Gentiles were rejecting the gospel. So what does it all mean? What about God's revelation of all those years to the Jewish people? Did you just have to write it off? And so Matthew's point, my dear friends, is to explain and prove that Jesus actually is the pinnacle of the Old Testament. He's the one that fulfills the Old Testament. And that in actual fact, God's plan was still on track. It hadn't moved in any way. He hadn't changed it. Because the whole of Israel's history was about him. You could understand that. And Matthew doesn't just do that by quoting the Old Testament. What he does is he structures, is an outline, his outline of his gospel is actually, and I'll give that to you next week, not this week, is an, he outlines his gospel and he takes the history of Israel, the high points of Israel, and he superimposes that on the life of Jesus, and Jesus actually shows that Jesus recapitulates the history of Israel. Now I'll show you that next week, and it will make more sense. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1. Matthew goes right back, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, not Genesis, Matthew, chapter 1. He goes right back to the beginning of Israel's history. That which formed the very basis of their relationship with Yahweh. And that was the covenant. And so you notice that Matthew opens with the genealogy of Jesus. I don't know what you do about the genealogies that you find in the in the Bible, you know, you decide you're going to read right from the Bible, and then you come to genealogies. This man begot that, and that begot that, and it, and how many of you read right through them? How many of you write through? Be honest. How many of you read through the genealogies? I'm glad to see somebody who's reading through the genealogies, because. They, they sound, they, it's almost as if there's no spiritual value there. They seem so boring. Uh, so, but let me say to you, for the Jews, it was absolutely important. It was absolutely important. It was comparable to a birth certificate or an ID or CV. The gene genealogy, you have to have a genealogy to prove that you were a Jew. So it was absolutely important. And that's where you find so many genealogies in the, in the Bible. And so it's a genealogy that Matthew begins, and we're going to read it in a few moments' time. Genealogy that Matthew begins with is not just an appendix. It is crucial to the unfolding of what he's going to say. It's crucial to his message of who Jesus is. And so let's read from chapter 1, and let's read through to verse 18. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. If you, if you understand anything of Jewish history in the Old Testament, you'll, you'll actually recognize some of those names there. Um, Ram, the father of um, Am Amanidah, Amanida, the father of Nachshon. Nachshon, the father of Salom, Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. You know something about Boaz, all right? Boaz, the father of Ebed, whose mother was Ruth. Do you see some connection there? And Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. And David, the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asa, and Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, 
Joram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah the father of Joth, Jotam, and Jotam the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Ammon, and Ammon the father of Josiah, Josiah the father of Jehonadai, and his brothers at the time of the exile of Babylon. And after the exile to Babylon, Jokuniah was the father of Shatil, and Shatil the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abahut, and Abahut the father of Eli Elikim, and Elikim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Ekim, and Ekim the father of Elihud, and Elihud the father of Eliza, Eliza, Eliza the father of Matan, and Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, and Joseph, uh, and the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, and so on. Now, you will, if you know your Old Testament, you'll recognize a number of those names there. They're quite clear. Uh, it actually is an outline of the history of Israel, by the way. Um, now, you'll notice that, that Matthew gives prominence to two names, two important names. Who are they? Two important names. They're prominent. They're in red letters. Abraham and? Abraham and David, you notice know that? The genealogy is structured around two names and one very, very important event. The exile. Two names. There's Abraham and David. And it's obvious that Matthew wanted his readers to actually see that. You notice in verse 2, in verse 6, in verse 17, David and, uh, and, and Abraham, and then there is the Exile. Now the question really is, why does he do that? Why does he do that? You've got to ask these questions when you read the Bible, you must ask questions. And you see, any Jew who read a genealogical, 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 sorry, genealogy, would immediately understand the significance of these two names. And they would also understand the significance of the exile. You see, folks, God made certain promises to both Abraham and to David. And that was what is called in the Bible a covenant. God made a covenant, a contract with them. So let's look first of all at Abraham that he mentions there. And he sets Jesus in the context of the father of the Jews, of Israel. That's Abraham. To prove that Jesus is a true descendant of Abraham. Now, to understand the significance of Abraham, you've got to go back to Genesis chapter 12, don't you? Remember what happened in Genesis chapter 12? Turn to Genesis chapter 12. God calls, his name was then Abram. God calls Abraham to leave his country. This is what we read in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. God, the Lord said, Yahweh said to Abraham, leave your country and your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. The question as you read that is, who did this covenant embrace? Who did this covenant embrace? Was it for the Jews only? Is it for the Jews only? It should be very obvious, my dear friends, that certainly the Jews were part of it. But it embraced all the nations. That's what he says. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, what is important is to see the context of Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 occurs after Genesis 11. That seems quite logical, doesn't it? What is Genesis 11 all about? Tell me what Genesis 11 is about. Babel. 
Babel. Understand what happened? God is first there. But actually, chronologically, chapter 11 is subsequent to chapter 10. Chapter 10 is the table of nations. You've got all the nations, all the nations of the earth are listed. There's 70 of them that are listed. The descendants of the three sons of, of Doah. So Genesis 10 tells us who the nations are and Genesis 11 tells us what had happened. And then you watch Genesis chapter 12. So when you look at that, you've got to realize that what God is saying to Abraham, those 70 nations, that it seems at this point in history, I'm turning away from them. Actually, I'm choosing you so that you will bring blessing to those nations. So the covenant, my dear friends, embraced all the nations, those very nations, those nations that were dispersed. There's another point I could just mention to you just by the way. You mustn't ignore that, the connection to Pentecost. Because in actual fact, Pentecost was a reversal of Babel. You understand that? Babel was the many times dispersed. Pentecost, they all here, they, all the nations, all the Jews from the different nations, they all hear the wonders of God in their own language. God unites them. And then, then at that point, it's the Jews first to become Christians. But then after that, remember, the gospel goes out to the nations of the world. That's what Jesus said. Make disciples of all nations. And so Pentecost, in many ways, was a reversal of what happened at Babel. God was lifting up his judgment from them so they could hear the gospel. So understand that God enters in this covenant with Abraham. And through Abraham, all the nations are going to be blessed. God's going to bring blessing to them. In chapter 15, God says the same thing. He repeats it to Abraham. Look at chapter 15, Genesis 15, verse 2. But Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? Then the word of the Lord came, Look at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And so think about it. What does God promise? What does God promise Abraham? In this covenant. He promises them a land. He promises them people, seed. So that his descendants can become the nations. And would bring blessing to the nations of the world. In fact, that really is the framework around the, the Bible uh, 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 structures. But notice the elements there. Think of the elements. There's a land and there's a people and there's going to be a king. What's that equal? A land, a people and a king. What is that equal? A kingdom. That's what God is promising Abraham. Understand? That's why Matthew emphasizes the kingdom time and time again. God is promising Abraham a kingdom. You see, the land wasn't just a piece, piece of real estate. God is promising them an inheritance. And that inheritance exceeded that land. God is promising them a kingdom. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. It's very interesting. Look at Hebrews 11. The great uh, chapter on faith. <coughs> It tells us in chapter 11, verse 8, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Verse 10. He was looking forward, and you've got to get this, he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. 
For people who speak thus make it clear they were seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about the land from which they'd gone out, they had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desired a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. In other words, that inheritance was far, far more than just that land. That inheritance was a kingdom. That's what Matthew is saying. And again, that is why Matthew constantly refers to the kingdom. Later on in chapter 17 of Genesis, God promises them a king as well, to Sarah as well. Turn to Genesis 49 verse 9. It looked very interesting when um, Jacob was blessing his sons. And uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's, it's, it's an amazing prophecy that there's Jacob... And this is what he says in verse 40, chapter 49, verse 9. Judah is a lion's cub. He's using metaphorical language. Judah is a lion's cub. From the, from the prey, my son, you have gone out. He stooped down. He crouches a lion as a lioness who dares rouse him. Now listen to this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him to him shall be the obedience of people. There is an announcement of, of a king. Understand that. It's an amazing prophecy connected to what God had said, a kingdom. So God has promised a land, a sea, a nation, and he promises a king. Understand that. And here is Jacob promising the very same thing. The king's going to come from the Judah's line. You've seen some connections there. And, and you realize, my dear friends, that, that the, the exodus, the deliverance of this motley group of Hebrew slaves from Egypt and God's protection of them and his provision for them and the subsequent establishment of a nation were all steps to the fulfillment of that kingdom, of that, of that, of that covenant God had made. Now Matthew wants us to understand, he wants his readers to understand that it was in Jesus that God planned to fulfill that covenant with Abraham. That you've got to understand. But what about David? Let's look at David. Because he's the other key figure, figure isn't he? David. And remember, God made a promise to him as well. Yeah, the, the promise of a king becomes more specific. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. Now tell my servant David, the Lord declares to you the Lord that Yahweh himself would establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I'll raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body. I will establish his kingdom. Your house, what sort of kingdom is it going to be? Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. That's an eternal kingdom, isn't it? The psalmist actually refers to that in Psalm 89. You said, I made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to my servant, David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm to all generations. Now that's exactly, my dear friend, the same covenant that God had made with Abraham. But it's expanded and particularized in David. And if you know anything about the life of David, you realize that David was given success by God. He not only conquered Israel's immediate enemies, the Philistines, what he did is he expanded the land to the very boundaries that God had promised to Abraham. And then under his son Solomon, they had the most glorious kingdom. Understand that. This is what you read about Solomon in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25, the Lord highly exalted Solomon in the sight of Israel and bestowed on him royal splendor such as no king over Israel had ever had. And it seemed, my dear friends, when you came to that point in the history of Israel, it seems that all of those problems, the covenant God made with Abraham, the covenant God made with David, it looks as like now it's fulfilled. Here's the kingdom. Here's the kingdom. Most glorious. I mean, you know that the nations were blessed through 
Israel at that time. There's the Queen of Sheba who comes. So it looks on the surface the promise of a kingdom has now been fulfilled. 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 56 as Solomon prays, praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel just as he promised not one word is failed of all the good promises of the covenant he gave to his servant Moses. That, my dear friends, was Israel's golden age. It was their golden age. And again the question is, is that the fulfillment of the covenant? Is this the kingdom? That's the question. Because there's a king ruling in Jerusalem right now. And the nation's on a subjection. But did you know anything about the history of Israel? You realize that wasn't true, was it? Because even in the time of Solomon, the rocks just began to set in, didn't it? We can only we can say it was a partial fulfillment, but it certainly wasn't fulfillment at all. After Solomon's death, you know what happens. They split. Ten tribes to the north and two tribes to the south. And there were some good kings in Judah, but in the north there were not there wasn't one good king. Because they were all worshipping other gods. And so that the result was this. And that's why the exile is there. Because that's what happens. Because if you thought that that was a fulfillment of the promise, it wasn't. Because what happens is they turn away from God. They worship other they worship other gods. And within 500 years, the Assyrians first, and then the Babylonians took them into captivity, and Judah was there for 70 years. And that's why, I look again, go turn back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 11, and that's why it's important to understand. Remember, you're a Jew, you're reading it. As a Jew, understand your history. Chapter 1, verse 11, remember his main point. It's all fulfilled in Jesus. And Josiah, the father of Je Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile, chapter 1, verse 12, after the exile to Babylon. So there are two prominent men. There's Abraham and there's David. And one disastrous historical event. And the question then is this. What about God's promise? What about the promise that God had entered? What about the covenant that God had made with Abraham and David? What about that? And it was the prophets who later on explained that it wasn't that God had gone back on his promise. It wasn't that God had been unfaithful. The problem was you people, Israel, were unfaithful. That's what the problem is. You turned away from your God. And so the prophets, if you read the prophets carefully, you'll see there's a twin scene particularly when you come to the exilic prophets and the first exilic prophets. There is a twin scene and some of the pre-exilic prophets. There's a twin scene that emerges. There is judgment. This is why you're, in, in, this is why you're here. It wasn't because Nebuchadnezzar was, 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 a, was a military genius. God handed you over to Nebuchadnezzar in judgment. But at the same time, the prophets point to a promised restoration. There will be, I will restore you. There's a promise that comes out and it's described in very graphic terms. But you remember that, that God actually, to point to that, to, to almost confirm that, God raises a, a pagan king. What was his name, by the way? A pagan king to allow them to go back to their land. Cyrus. Cyrus. God allows them, and that's a remarkable event. He allows them to go back to their land. And maybe they thought this is now the kingdom. And they, 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 they build the walls of Jerusalem and they put up another temple and so on. And it looks almost as if this is now, God is restoring us. But they realized it wasn't true. I mean, for example, those who had, as they were watching, seeing that when they had the dedication of the temple, it's a very interesting uh, remark in this matter. As they saw that, the old men who had seen the temple of Solomon wept. Because this was like a bontoki comparison to what they was. So they knew this wasn't the promise, this was the fulfillment. And then 400 years, silence. 
400 years, God never spoke to them. That's after the book of Malachi. 400 years, there's nothing. Can you imagine 400 years? When did Yankee Rebecca come to the, to the cave? I, mean, look, I understand that the history of, of Africa is far longer than that, but just for the sake of argument, when did he come to the cave? 1652. How long ago is that? Literally, he was some. 300 something. So think about 400 years. 400 years, God didn't speak to them. This God had spoken them for thousands of years, now he doesn't speak to them. And then suddenly, dramatically, a man appears in the wilderness. And his name is John the Baptist. And this is what Matthew says. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Think about it. The promise of the kingdom, the covenant God made with Abraham and with David. And then it all comes crashing down. And they're in exile, they're in judgment. They, they never, they never, ever were free from oppression. Never. Because you remember they were, in, uh, they were oppressed by the Greeks, they were oppressed by the Romans, and by the time you open the New Testament, they are oppressed by the Romans. And so think about that. So where's this kingdom? And then suddenly, after 400 years of silence, it's almost as if God said, I've done with you. I'll have nothing more to do with you. 400 years, and then chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent for what? The kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. The kingdom of God is here. Jesus is the very same thing in chapter 4 verse 17. From that time Jesus began to preach, prepared for the kingdom of God is at hand. And what Matthew wants his readers to understand, my dear friends, that all the expectations, all the promises of the kingdom that they thought had been dashed to the ground because of the sinfulness of Israel, that they were not on the border. I don't know if that's the right word, the word of putting it. But it's just about to be fulfilled. That covenant is going to be fulfilled in whom? In Jesus. Jesus is going to fulfill it. And what Matthew wants us, what his readers wants us to understand is that God never intended that covenant to be completely fulfilled in the land and the nation of Israel or in David and his glorious reign. And that's why he talks so much about the kingdom. You see, the Jews thought, again we need to think about the way Jews thought. The Jews thought the kingdom would come, just like we think about the second coming. We know when the Lord comes again. We may, we may not all agree on how it's going to happen, but we know, we all believe that Jesus is coming again. We do. And we know it's going to happen dramatically. Now we believe that. But the Jews thought that the kingdom would come in the same way the Messiah would come. It would be dramatic. It would happen at the end of time. That he would defeat his enemies and like David defeated his enemies. And I don't blame them for thinking like that. Because in the way the prophets described the coming of the kingdom it looked like that. Except for Daniel. Daniel was the exception. You saw the kingdom as a small stone. Remember that great Colossus? The small stone that hits the great kingdoms of the world and they all come crashing down and that stone gets bigger and bigger and bigger and fills the old earth. But other than that, I don't blame the Jews for thinking this. But you see, contrary to expectations, Jesus is saying to them, the kingdom isn't going to come at the end of the age, dramatically. Kingdom is going to come in me. In the present age. Not in the, in the present age. The kingdom is actually coming in me. So where do you see that? Turn to Matthew 12, verse 28. Are, are you with me, folks? Maybe this is a bit a bit deep, deep of it for some of you. But keep with me. You'll eventually understand it. Matthew 12, verse 28. Listen to this. Jesus is actually saying this in the face of accusations from the Pharisees and scribes. And Jesus says, but if by the Spirit of God I cast out demons, then 
The kingdom of God has come upon you. What's Jesus saying? The power that I've exhibited is the power of the king of the kingdom. And it's proof that the kingdom has actually entered the present age. Not at the end of the age. It's entered now. 20 verse 29. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house, that's Satan, and plunder his goods, unless he first binds a strong man, then indeed can plunder the house. That's what Jesus came to do. But the crucial question is this. What sort of kingdom? What sort of kingdom? That's the crucial question. Now, some of us believe, some Christians believe that Jesus offered the Jews an earthly kingdom. And that he would defeat Rome, he'd set up a kingdom in Jerusalem, and then rule from his throne in Jerusalem. But they refused the kingdom. And so he turned to the Gentiles. But folks, if you read the Gospels very carefully, you should have no doubt what sort of kingdom the Jews wanted. They actually wanted an earthly kingdom. That's what they wanted. They wanted the Messiah who would defeat Rome. They wanted a king like David sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. And that's why there were times when they tried to make Jesus king. I mean, <clears throat> this misunderstanding was shared by the mother of John and James. Listen to this in Matthew chapter 20, verse, chapter, Matthew 20, verse 20. Think about what she's asking for and how she thinks of the kingdom. <clears throat> and the mother of, mother of the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, came to, his, came to him with her sons and kneeling <clears throat> before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said, say that these two sons of mine will sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. What sort of kingdom is she thinking of? What kingdom? An earthly kingdom. Please. Bring my two sons into your cabinet. That's what she's saying. But what the Jews didn't understand is that Jesus hasn't come to establish an earthly kingdom at all. And that's why they rejected him. He wasn't to raise up armies to fight the Romans. He was going to do the most unthinkable thing ever. He was going to fight that battle on the cross. Remember that? He was going to defeat, he wasn't there just to defeat the Romans. He was going to defeat the enemy of enemies. Our greatest enemy, he was going to defeat Satan. That's what was happening. That was the battle that was taking place. That's why Paul says he made a public spectacle of, he disarmed Satan and made a public spectacle of him, triumphing, triumphing over him by the cross. I hope you're understanding what I'm talking about. Because Jesus Christ was not fitting into their idea of a kingdom. That's not the kingdom they wanted. You remember on <clears throat> when he went into Jerusalem on we call Palm Sunday, and they would say, Hosanna to the king of Jacob. Hosanna. They want to make him king. They think he's now come to establish his kingdom. Now raise armies, he's now going to establish his kingdom, and then it doesn't happen. And there's the king standing, and Pilate says, Behold your king, we do not want him as a king. That's not the idea there, the idea of a king. Standing there having been whipped, and then having to be put on the cross, that's not a king. Pilate puts on at the top, king of the Jews, and the Pharisees and the scribes say, Don't say that, say, he said he was the king of the Jews, because he can't be not hanging on a cross there. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand from the very beginning it was a spiritual kingdom. That's why Jesus says to Pilate, my kingdom is not to this world. And that's what Matthew wants us to understand. It's not the kingdom you thought. You didn't understand that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the king of the kingdom. He is the one who is the seed of David. He is the one who, who, who is fulfilling the covenant that God made to be a blessing to the nations. And, and very interesting, <clears throat> and we're not going to have time, Go through this. But in a series of parables from chapter 11, 
In a series of parables, Jesus actually explains, he corrects their understanding of the kingdom. He wants them to understand. I'm just referring to it. There's a parable of the sower. What does that parable say? It say not all will accept the kingdom, particularly the Jews. Not all will accept the kingdom that I'm offering. The parable of the weeds. The kingdom will coexist with the kingdoms of Satan. They thought that when the kingdom came, the kingdom of Satan disappeared. No, 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 it won't happen. They will coexist for a period of time. The mustard and the yeast seed. The kingdom will be hidden and then begin insignificantly and then grow and extend to the ends of the earth. The treasure and the pearl, the kingdom is of great worth. The net, the kingdom will divide. All Jews thought they were part of the kingdom, but it's going to divide. And what is amazing, my dear friends, is that even the disciples were under the wrong impression. Even after Jesus told them, even after the resurrection, do you remember that just before Jesus went into, ascended into heaven, they said to Jesus, um, is this the time that you're going to, that's Acts 1, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom? They're still thinking the same way. And Jesus is not for you to know, but what you've got to do is, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and where? The nations. The ends of the earth. And the Jews were in for a great shock, you see, as well. Because the Matthew tells them that the Jews are sort of confident, they were confident they were members of the kingdom. He says, you won't be. Look at Matthew 8, verse 11. Look at Matthew 8, verse 11. He's warning them already as they get excited about the kingdom. And he says to them, I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. While the sons of the kingdom, that's Israel, who is thrown into utter darkness, in that place they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The whole idea of the, the parable that Jesus told of the wedding feast, the same idea. Nicodemus had to learn that just because he was a Jew didn't mean he was a member of the kingdom. Remember that? What did Jesus say to you? To be a member of the kingdom, you must be born again. It's a spiritual kingdom. You be born again. And how would that kingdom extend? How would that kingdom grow? Well, of course, folk, they say again, the great battle was fought at the cross. And that's where Satan is defeated. And Jesus then said to his disciples, now all authority, on the basis of that, that he defeated Satan, he says, now on the basis of all authority in heaven and earth, give it to me. Therefore, do what? Make disciples of the nations. You understand what Matthew was saying. Jesus fought the fight. The kingdom is realized in him, but it's not the kingdom that you think. It's a different kingdom. It one day will end up in a physical kingdom and the new heaven and the new earth. But right now, the kingdom of God is small, it's insignificant, but it's here. And it coexists with the kingdoms of the world. But what I want you to do, what our present job is, <clears throat> our job is to be witnesses to that kingdom and preach the gospel that we make disciples of all nations. The kingdom extends, my dear friends, to the preaching of the gospel. That's how the kingdom extends. And you see that from Pentecost onwards, where you've got to, <coughs> excuse me, who are a remnant of the Jews, they become Christians, and then the kingdom extends to the nations. And it's very interesting, you see, that Paul defended that and explained that. He says, I have been the least of the apostles, my job has been to take this gospel to the nations, to the Greeks, to the the Gentiles and so on. You remember there was that, that problem that some of the Jews couldn't understand. That's what he, he dedicated his life to that. And what is interesting is you come to there, and, and that's what Acts is all about. You see, actually, you see how the kingdom extends from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and then it moves to the ends of the earth. And what is interesting is that when you 
come to the end of Acts after Luke has explained that. He has Paul sitting near the end of his life. He's under house arrest. And 28 verse 30, Acts 28 verse 30. And Luke tells us he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. Now listen to this, verse 31. This is the last verse of Acts. Proclaiming what? The kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ was all boldness and our hindrance. All right. Is that making sense to you? You look as though you're very mesmerized now. So let me summarize. God's covenant of a kingdom that he made with Abraham, his covenant of a king that he made with David, is realized in Jesus Christ. He's the apex of it. He's the one who fulfills it all. But it's not from the type of kingdom we think. It's an eternal kingdom. And it is a kingdom, my dear friends, and this is where it comes down to us. It's a kingdom to which you belong and I belong. We belong to the kingdom of God. So if you're born again, if you're not born again, you're not a member of the kingdom. You may be a member of the church, but you're not a member of the kingdom. You need to be born again. You need the spirit to give you a new heart. Then you can be a member of the kingdom. And those of us who are members of the kingdom, we understand the kingdom has already entered the present age. The king rules. And as we face the difficulties of our, our world today and all the problems and the, the things that are happening in Israel and Palestine and in Ukraine and so on and in our own country, all of that, and we, we, we become fearful. We need to realize, my dear friends, that Jesus Christ is ruling right now. He's not going to rule in the present. He's ruling right now. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I mentioned this to you before, but if you want to ask the question, well, what is God doing now? What is God doing now? You're talking about the king. You're talking about the powers of the king. You're talking about all these things. What is God doing now? I mean, look at the chamorts that we're facing. Look at the problems we're facing in the world. Look at the problems we're facing in our own country. <clears throat> and, our, and many of us, are, <clears throat> our hope is that our in a decent election, whether it's going to happen or not, I don't know. It's irrelevant, actually. Um, except for my investments. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. Listen to what Paul says. He's talking about the resurrected body. For as an Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first truth, that Jesus Christ is the first one who was ever raised from the dead. Then we will, at his coming. That's going to happen. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God, that kingdom he delivers to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power for him as a reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. What is Paul saying? He's telling you exactly what Jesus is doing right now. He's saying there, the end time resurrection has already started. Christ has been raised. And I've explained to you that your resurrection, if you're a Christian, you've already been resurrected. Spiritually. Spiritually. That's what new birth is. All right? You've been given the life of the other. You're still waiting for your body. That's what we're waiting And then we, that's what Paul is saying. Is at the end that's what happened. But in the meantime, what is Christ doing? Christ is right now exercising his authority through the gospel and through the events in history. He's exercising his authority to bring down the kingdoms of the world right now. You've got to get that. We've got to have that confidence, my dear friend. God is not sitting there, Jesus is not just sitting there praying and interceding for us. He is doing that, but part of his intercession, my dear friend, is to bring down the kingdom of the world. There's not one kingdom that has ever existed that has not been brought down. Everyone. That's the story of history. How did that all happen? How did communism suddenly, I know there's certain elements of communism still around, but how did communism persist crumble? How? 
Who did it? Who is responsible for it? God. Who broke down the burden wall? God broke it down. Who broke the nationalist government down? I will not try to do that. God broke it down. Who's going to bring down the ANC? God's going to bring it down. There's not one kingdom. There's not one ideology. There's not one philosophy, my dear friend, that's going to exist permanently. They're going to be brought down. Understand that. And that's Jesus is doing that. Until there will be no more kingdoms, and then the kingdom of the world will be like the kingdom of God order and of His Christ. That's what Jesus is doing. And you and I, by the way, are part of that kingdom. We're citizens of that kingdom. And the power that you and I have is the power of the preaching of the gospel. It is for the gospel, my dear friends, that the kingdoms are not done. It is for the gospel, my dear friends, that men and women are changed. It is for the gospel that the kingdom extends. Understand that. When you become a Christian, Paul says he transferred you from the power of Satan and brought you into the kingdom of the God he loves. Are you a Christian? Hmm? Isn't it a marvelous thing that you have been? It wasn't what you did. It's through grace. He took you out of the power of Satan, the dominion of darkness, and he put you into the kingdom. Now, if you're a Christian, you remember that kingdom. And we're under a king. And it's our responsibility. You live out kingdom principles, the way we live, the way we witness, the way we conduct our work, the way we conduct our family life. In every each world of kingdom principles, my dear friend, is it just what I do on Sunday? Kingdom principles is the way I live. It's the philosophy of my life. I don't have to tell people who have been noticed outside my up on the office table, I'm a Christian. I don't have to do that. Maybe I shouldn't do it. Because they can see it. I hope. Amen. That's kingdom. 